I'm Michael Wilson. I'm the Chief Executive of the Australian Water Partnership. And the AWP's role is to connect Australian and international water expertise to international development needs. And of course, knowledge sharing and experience sharing is a very important element of this. And this is what this webinar series uh, attempts to add to. This is the third ep episode of the AWP webinar series leading up to our annual partners workshop on the 5th to the 7th of August on the topic of water security in a changing world. It's only open to partners to attend, but noting that many other interested parties are in the audience today, we should also let you know that some parts will be available to access online following the workshop. As you may be aware, the Australian Water Partnership is supported by the Australian Official Development Assistance Program through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. But of course, any views expressed during this webinar don't necessarily represent the views of the Australian government. In the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, water and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with us today. So during the webinar today, we're able to collect questions for the Q&A session towards uh, the end of the, uh, of the, of the session. Um, if you could please type those into the chat box on your Zoom control panel. And also, if you have any issues with the audio today, please also use the chat box to let us know and we'll try and fix any issues from our end. Live captioning is also being provided for today's webinar and you can click on the link shown in the chat box to access this. The webinar is being recorded and will be shared afterwards along with presentations and key messages as we've done in the previous two webinars in this series. Our objective in this series is to provide a platform for exchange of knowledge on some of the key issues in the water space. We are highlighting work of AWP partners, but we're also bringing experts from elsewhere to provide different points of view into the discussion. The first webinar explored how climate change impacts, features and challenges affect water security globally with a focus on the Pacific. The second webinar showcased different approaches to water resilience. Both emphasized community engagement as foundational to water governance. This third webinar will share the knowledge and experience of experts working across different aspects of community engagement and water governance. We'll highlight experiences and perspectives on community engagement as a critical element in effective water governance in Australia and in partner countries in the Indo-Pacific. So to our speakers today, Josiah Osborne is Deputy Director of the Pacific Islands Association of Non-Governmental Organisations. And he will address us on localization in water and development and community engagement in water governance. Dr. Poling Tan, Emeritus Professor at Griffith University and Australian Water Partnership Advisory Committee member, will talk about stakeholder engagement in water reform. Phil Duncan from the Policy and Strategy Advisory Group at Alluvium will address us on community engagement and Indigenous water governance. Katrina Donaghy, Chief Executive Officer at Civic Ledger, will talk to us about open data as a critical element in enabling community engagement in water governance. So to set the scene, Josiah Osborne, as I said, Deputy Executive Director and Program Manager for Piango, a regional NGO with members and networks in 24 Pacific Island countries and territories. Uh, Josiah joined Piango in 2018 and was involved in conducting research on localization of humanitarian responses in Fiji, Tonga, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. The work on localization is a joint partnership between Piango and the Humanitarian Advisory Group and is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia. Josiah hails from the village of Lamati, which is in the island of Thithia, 
in the province of Laos and Fiji. He volunteers his time to support community projects in his village, as well as in the informal settlements in Lamy town, where he currently resides. Bula Josiah, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, Nisam Bula Dinaka, Nimata Dinaka Mai, Tormanda, Ugea Torno Nongo, Matam Tamsaki Nagonua, Benari Nagonua, Aborigine Skarti Monsterelia, Kinda Vaikin Talanga Leoni, Leoni, Leoni Bonua, Navi Mata, Mata Menevi Song Song, when you put around Bosu, Nambos in the Vital Nanakan. Um, Ms. Ambulvinaka, and welcome everyone. Um, I pay my respects to the indigenous people and also uh, my respects as well to you, our fellow participants and panelists. Before I begin, I hail from the island of Didia. Uh, Lomat, I hail from the village of Lomati, Didia, in the province of Lao, my totems. Um, I, I belong to the clan of uh, Namama, and my family unit is called uh, Naivinga. To begin with, um, Kopi Yango, I'm currently working as the Deputy Executive Director for a regional NGO that serves the Pacific Island countries and territories. For us, for this work, we, are, we, we focus on um, our main vision is for a united Pacific and to strengthen the resilient responsiveness of our Kainga or family of Pacific Islanders for a peaceful and prosperous Vanua. When we talk about Vanua, we mean um, the relationships that we have with one another. Um, when we talk about the Vanua, it means the land, it means the, the cosmology and the various ecosystems. So what that is the work that Piango is currently doing in terms uh, at the regional level. Eh? We are a regional network. Uh, we provide a common voice and for collective action um, at the regional level as well. So in our work, we have members at the national level and they have their constituents at the subnational level. So we work, um, while we work at the regional level, in terms of our work in country, we have to go through our various uh, networks or members in order to reach the various communities. Thank you. Um, that's just a brief explanation about Piango before we move on. Yes, right. For my engagement today, um, uh, I've been asked to set the scene. So my, my presentation is focused mainly on our localization research uh, within the humanitarian space in the, at the region. Eh? When we talk about localization, it's about strengthening the local actors. So that um, in terms of a humanitarian response, it's strengthening local actors so that they can respond to the needs of the communities that they serve. Eh? Um, we, are, we are all aware in terms of, um, of localization when we, when we go out for humanitarian response, there's an element of community engagement because you are required to engage with the community. But in terms of the work that we do, um, uh, that, is a, that will be part of the discussions uh, this afternoon, but I would like to set the scene by just highlighting our work. Piango in 2018, we, we, de we, start, uh, we developed, uh, started a partnership. We founded a partnership with the Humanitarian Advisory Group on localization, um, for the localization work. And this partnership um, is something that I would like to highlight to the, to the participants in terms of our engagement, in terms of the partnership principles that one would need before they engage with the community. Yeah? Um, for us, in terms of the partnership, um, developing this partnership, uh, we, we have to come together for Piango. Yeah? We invested in the time together and allowed space uh, between Piango, HEG, and our members at the regional level um, so that we, uh, we work together to broker this process. What should this partnership look like? So first of all, when developing a partnership, I know that many of you will be working with the community from our experience at Piango. We started off with that, we invest spending time uh, together, allow space so that there's mutual understanding to shape what our partnership would look like. It will require a lot of planning, um, planning meetings uh, in, the initial, in the initial partnership development uh, phase. Uh, we also set the tone where we agreed that we'll have a, honest conversation if one of our partners, whether from the NLU or from our members at the NLU or from HEG, um, we, do, we do not uh, agree on something, we set the, the tone eh, in terms of allowing for that open conversation which challenges other and agreed on how do we address issues uh, constructively. So those are some of the things that we do.
it seems that uh, Josiah's uh, internet might have been interrupted. We're just going to wait to see if we can re-establish the connection. Shall I continue? Uh, yes, please. Sorry, we just lost you for a moment, Josiah. My, my apologies for the connectivity from this side. So in terms of uh, planning, uh, um, we, we, we have to allocate, um, one of the things is for both Yango and HAG to invest resource in the process, eh? such as staff time in terms of developing, uh, developing our partnership. And we are also agreed to review, to uh, as basically a commitment to making a time for regular partnership uh, reviews on an annual basis. Our work is both, uh, basically in terms of our partnership with the Human Care Advisory Group and with uh, our NLUs, it's, it's based on a complementarity where we look at what are the mutual uh, benefits and visibility that we can, uh, can bring to our organization. We try and add value. So for instance, if there are some things, some uh, skills that we saw in HEC, they share that experience with us. And in that way, we develop the skill. As well as for Piango, when we work with our NLUs to conduct the research, there's always a complementarity where we share the skills, the research skills. Eh? And mind you, most of the, the enumerators that go out to the community are mostly from the communities themselves. So there is a skill sharing, a skills uh, transfer that were, that were conducted during our, um, for the initial uh, implementation of the research. In terms of uh, developing the principles, our principles are based on a transformative, uh, transformative partnership principles. Um, and it's not solely based for many of us, we are, when we do projects, we try and aspire to just deliver the output, but this is something that we, it goes beyond just the delivery of output. We seek to change the dynamic, we seek to change the system, to transform the system, plus also make positive uh, changes in support of local leadership eh, for the localization. In addition, uh, we are always, we are committed to, these are some of the uh, core principles that we develop transparency and the commitment to quality. We are mutually accountable to one another in terms of the work that we do. Uh, we ensure a sustainable, um, uh, the, the collaboration that we have will uh, yield a sustainable outcome. So for instance, when you conduct research, um, the, the outcomes of the research is basically uh, taken on board by our members at the national level who will uh, take on the work in terms of um, carry on the work at the national level in terms of not only with the implementation at the, at the ground, but also in terms of policy advocacy. Yeah? We are always respectful. Um, this is something that we are all taught to be to respect one another. Yeah? It's, it's a value that we have not only in the Pacific, uh, in Fiji, we call it the Bindokai, to respect one another. Um, and then we are also, um, there's also uh, in terms of our car, we, we adhere to ethical standards. So for HEG, um, they are aligned to the ECPID uh, ethical standards. ECPID is actually, for many of you, the Australian Council for International Development is actually one of our, of our networks, in is our network in Australia. So they adhere to that. Well, for us at Piango, when you work in country, <coughs> excuse me, we adhere to the ethical standards that we have. Piango has its code of minimum standards uh, in terms of ethics. Plus also we try to adhere to the various uh, approaches that are available in country. And that brings um, me to the approach, um, the research approach that we undertake in, in terms of ethical. And um, in terms of the work that we do, um, why uh, approaches is, is really important is because it informs us um, on the work. Yeah? So for Piango, our work is couched in our Piango values and principles on development effectiveness. We need to always ensure that in the work that we do, we, uh, it will enhance the human the rights. Uh, we use a rights-based approach to development, whether it's in water development or any other type of development. We need to ensure that there are various principles on development effectiveness. Our approaches as well is embedded in our Pacific approaches and values. So for instance, if you are working at um, in Fiji, working with the communities in Fiji, we need to ensure that we align our work to the Vanua framework. So within this Vanua framework, um, um, and, and our, even our partnership as well is aligned to the Bono framework where we have that overall, it has a various um, processes from the conceptualization right down to the, it's called the which is to report back. When we work with community, 
we need to integrate participatory and localized approaches. Yeah? And this is one of the other no framework. We have like a color framework in Tonga. So those are some of the framework that we adopt for our, for our partnership with humanitarian advisory group with regards to our localization work. We also ensure that our work is aligned to the requirements at the national uh, of the national research policies. So with that in mind, uh, you know, at times we need to seek the consent um, of those at the those at the decision at the, at the decision uh, level, eh? national research policies. When we translate that back to the Vanua or to the to the communities, there's also a need for a free, prior, and informed consent uh, when we when we are about to go and uh, conduct uh, interviews at the communities. Eh? We, there are local government systems that we recognize that we really need to 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 actually seek their consent and the traditional uh, systems or the cheaply systems that are available at the villages. So those are some of the things that we are mindful of in terms of our approach. Um, and another thing, uh, uh, my last point I'd like to share in terms of setting the scene, uh, uh, our partnership approach is about ensuring uh, ownership by partners, not only by between Piango uh, and HEG and its uh, members, but also from the communities themselves. Eh? We um, we aspire to have a, in terms of a planning and designing, there's a need to co-create and uh, to co-create uh, co the, the process, uh, the project in itself. So in terms of key dis discussion, um, from the conceptualization to reporting back that uh, in terms of for you working at the community level from the Pacific, there needs to be a shared ownership. Those who will be beneficiaries, they need to be roped in from the planning, design, and implementation and learning. And that is something that uh, many of us, um, when you go out to do projects, you just go in, come out. There's a need to involve them. Eh? Um, we also need to ensure uh, there's a, uh, a thing that we call the Pacific consciousness. It's about placing the uh, community at the center of what we do, adhere to the various protocols, we need to be appropriate, timely, and ensure that the projects that we do add value are always beneficial. And finally, we need to be ethical in our approach. We ensure that uh, the do no harm principles and the FPIC free prior informed consent um, is undertaken um, when uh, conducting, um, when implementing a project, or even in the initial planning, implementation and the reporting. I think um, that is all. Um, from this afternoon before I I'll leave the time for questioning uh, Michael but in terms of uh, my last point this afternoon I'd just like to share with you that poem by Lila Watson an Aboriginal activist that if you have if you have come to help us you are wasting your time but you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine and let us work together so in terms of community engagement ensure that you work together with the communities that you serve thank you Michael Great, thank you, Josiah. Um, that is uh, is wonderful to hear ambitions uh, towards transforming the system um, based, I think, on on universal development principles like transparency, quality, accountability, ethical approaches, evidence based approaches. Uh, but in the context of uh, a Vanua framework, which uh, uh, which which is built for local circumstances and local people. So thank you very much for that um, fascinating presentation, Josiah. So next I'd like to introduce Pauline Tan. Pauline is an Emeritus Professor at Griffith University in Queensland and a member, as I said before, of the Australian Water Partnership Advisory Committee. She has over 35 years experience in legal practice and academia and is recognised as one of the foremost water governance experts in Australia. Pauline serves on a number of national boards and advisory committees, and she's provided policy advice on aspects of water reform and planning to federal and state governments. She's published two books and numerous articles, particularly on water planning and community engagement in water reform. Over to you, Pauline. Thank you very much for the introduction, Michael. I don't know whether people can see me. I hope they do. Um, Today, I'm going to speak on um, public participation and looking at a case study. I don't know whether you can see my slides. I can't see them. So could you please put the slides on? 
Yes. So I'm looking at a case study of the Murray Darling Basin. And uh, next slide, please. I want to look firstly at some international guidelines for engagement, then take you to some of the um, things that have happened in the uh, development of the Murray Darling Basin Plan. And then lastly, end on international applicability because not everything is applicable. Next slide, please. I want to start with the International Association of Public Participations Spectrum. And a lot of you would be familiar with this already. Now, this comes from an acknowledgement that governments can no longer act on their own. If there are complex problems, then those problems can only be solved by acting together with the public. So the term public participation was born. Now that term is now slowly transforming to another term called community engagement. So those two terms are used interchangeably. With community engagement, which is the more commonly used term these days, there is a distinction that engagement is seen as ongoing, two-way or multi-ways, and it's a process where the focus is not on the decision alone, but on the relationships that build towards the decision. So if you look at that slide, on the left-hand side is inform and consult. Now, with Focusing on the consult column, it says the goal in the consult column is to obtain public feedback on analysis or alternatives, which the public really has not been uh, formulating. So the alternatives are formulated by government and it's getting feedback. Now the promise from the government to the community is we will keep you informed, we will listen and acknowledge your concerns, and then when we do that, we will provide feedback on how your concerns have influenced the decision. So that's consult. Now you move along and right at the end on the right hand side is empower. Empower is the goal of empowering is to place the decision in the hands of the public. And the promise is that we, the government, will implement any decision that you make. However, for government decision making, public, the public is seldom empowered. I have not seen this except in very localized specific situations. So somewhere governments land in the informed consult involve or collaborative space. I think the best publics can, the public can expect is the collaborate space. Now, if we go next slide. With, next slide please. With the Murray Darling Basin Plan, this came within a reform process that had started in Australia in 1994 and continued in 2004. The reform process had several important planks or, or um, goals. Firstly, it was to give the environment a share of the water, which would be protected as much as consumptive use. So that was one. Second one was to introduce a tradable water entitlement and establish a national water market. And then there were others. There was pricing, there was statutory water planning and all of that. But we want to to look at the first two, which is giving the environment a share of the water and then the market. Now to do all of that, the government say that 
we would then accept that communities need to be consulted and that they would have avenues for community input. So those were the words used in reform documents. Now, when we look at the Murray-Darling Basin, which is a huge basin, we see that there are many, many sub-basins. Indeed, the basin can be divided into a northern basin and a southern basin. Within each of these sub-basins, there are many interest groups. So there are environmental groups, there are local groups, there are irrigators, there are non-irrigators, there are community groups, you get the idea. And the, the basin is very large and contributes a lot to the um, Australian economic um, interests. There are six government stakeholders, four states, one territory, the ACT, and then the Commonwealth. Now for, for water plants such as this, it is inescapable that it is top down. It starts top down. A lot of communities want bottom up processes. Top down and bottom up processes are completely different. So this was unashamedly at the first, a top down activity. The, started with the Murray Darling Basin Authority. And of course, a lot of you know that in the basin, there was river rhyme degradation, there was overuse, and there, was, there have been massive droughts in this time. So the reform initially wanted to recover three to 4,000 gigalitres a year of water because water had been overused and over allocated. And that is 20% recovery of extracted water. Now this is a test of how stakeholders and the wider public would perceive the need to reduce extraction. Next slide, please. The first step of planning is clearly situated within the cons consult category of participation. When the Basin Guide, which is a draft plan, 2010 went out and this was distributed to the public. Initially, the irrigation community had very negative perceptions. Next. In 2010, as I said, there was considerable hostility. Next. It was typified by one way communication large town hall meetings. So there was one meeting in Brisbane, one meeting in the major towns, and in the regions, there was also large meetings. In those meetings, the chief executive and the chair of the authority would speak and almost give a lecture. Uh, not, uh, there would be opportunities for discussion, but very little. And their questions, the public's questions could not always be answered because the chair is very high up. The chief executive cannot really answer local questions. And the, the basin guide was this thick, very slick. Next. So authority was not prepared to de deal with tensions that arose. When people start shouting at meetings, there was no way of dealing with this. Next, because of the, the open hostility that was, um, that was exhibited in many of the regions, the guide was abandoned. The leadership resigned within six months and that set the, the, the cause for a complete re-engagement process. Next slide, please. So as I said, three members of the authority resigned, including the chair and the CEO. And there was opportunity to recast the process, consider its 
communication methodologies and completely change the style and approach. So you will see that the recovery volume instead of three to 4,000 gave various alternatives and gave presented the science be, behind the alternatives. Eventually the recovery volume was reduced to 2,750 with a few trade-offs. So with some adjustment within that goal. The new chair who was an ex-politician worked with regional power brokers in more than 20 towns. Now his approach was this, no surprises. We promise you that we will work with you as much as possible to tell you what is planned. No surprises was the approach. The other thing that the chair said to um, the, the um, executives within the authority is, you go and find diamonds in the dust. So go and see who in the community will work with you to be champions. So regional meetings involve staff members, not just the top leadership, who were able to answer operational questions. Taking the time was another part of the approach, smaller roundtable discussions hosted by local groups, perhaps a, a environmental group, perhaps a wetlands group to facilitate in-depth technical discussions. Right, next please. What are the lessons from this case study? Communities expect meaningful engagement, not just information giving. We have to recognize that the community is not a homogenous group, but there are diverse and competing interests. We have to develop a networking engagement style, engage champions. New strategies are needed to reach a different inclusive public. Thank you for your patience. I will mute and stop the video. Thank you very much, Pauline, uh, for that fascinating rundown on the Murray Darling story and some principles uh, you've extracted very well from that for our work on international development. And uh, just by way of a bit of cross promotion, the AWP is also sponsoring a podcast series uh, at the moment, six episodes on the subject of water for development. Uh, and this morning we recorded an episode with Malcolm Turnbull, who of course, spent a lot of his political career working on Murray-Darling issues. So next I'd like to introduce Phil Duncan. Phil is from Moree in New South Wales and is a member of the Gomorrah Nation Native Title Claimant Group. He provides strategic advice and leadership around culture and heritage significance, community engagement in projects, and the design, delivery, and implementation of programs in partnership with government. Phil has made contributions in education and organisational reconciliation action through to natural resource management, freshwater river management, forestry, native fish, water rights and allocations. He is active in representing different viewpoints and creating trusting and collaborative relationships. Over to you, Phil. Yama. Yeah, um, I too wish to acknowledge the uh, many nations, both nationally and internationally, where people join us today and say a huge marabou, which is thank you to the um, AWP for inviting me um, to be a guest today, a guest panellist. Um, so community engagement and water governance. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, one of the profound stumbling blocks I have found in my time in the water arena is time and time and time again, we have a changing of the guard. And one of the things that is cyclic is our connection, reasserting our connection to family and country. And we all have mentors within our families, clans, 
um, and nations. I just want to acknowledge my grandfather, uh, and that's an image of him standing under the tree that he was born under, that which still stands today on the lands of Terry High High. Uh, the far right images of that of myself um, in 2017 with 14 PhD candidates from Macquarie University. And our connection is um, not just with land and water, it's also with our constellations. And I just wanted to give you an image of the many totems um, that I uh, have in my life and my song line, recognizing my song line country connection to that of Booba Lagoon. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I've come across a lot of people um, in my um, time um, in the water arena and natural resource management. One of them, uh, a gentleman that I would like to acknowledge um, that had an impact on me with some of his um, literature and some of the long yarns we had at Macquarie University, that's um, Emeritus Professor uh, Richie Howard. And again, I'm not probably stating anything different. In fact, with Josiah and the many other Aboriginal people from around this country of Australia and internationally, we actually talk in the mirrors about um, you know, what Richie Howard got to record and, and recognise was that specific threats to our, our territories and our ability of, um, of, of our peoples to sustain our cultural relationships and our duties and customs that involve our traditional lands accompany these general processes um, that are threatening our very existence. Um, though we have grown in the last um, in, in population as per the last census. We are still what somewhat um, operating from a deficit position in realizing our full potential uh, in the water arena. And water is central to our life, our very, very everyday existence, not just our cultural existence. And it's part of our law. Next slide, please. Just to give you an idea, this is a, a piece of work that was done by a, a researcher Sorry, I, I can't, I just don't have his name uh, at the moment, but one of the um, things about our people is this um, spiritual and intrinsic birthright connection to country and water's centrality to that, to those stories of the past, the present, and also um, as we educate them and um, teach them into our next generations, into our future generations. And it's around this um, connection to country and our cultural values. So next slide, please. Across Australia, we are as diverse as a people as what we are as a nation. Inside this nation, there are more than 326 plus different nations and different dialects. And one of the, 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 the problems we face in the water arena is water speak and understanding um, you know, the law, the water laws and the language. So when we talk, start talking about governance and start um, uh, asking um, and realizing our potential or creating the pathways um, for better interaction and better management of our water resources across this country, we need to understand that languages uh, in water speak is as foreign to us as any other language. And we also need to think about um, how we can demystify that We'll unpack that a little bit more um, in the next couple of slides. And I also want to acknowledge as we go to the next slide that in the year, in this year, we're, we're in the year of reconciliation more than a word. And as we progress towards the, the, our national NAIDOC week, which is about healing country, um, understanding that there was an Aboriginal, uh, an original water industry. Um, and uh, the Indigenous Energy Australia CEO, Michael Frangos, led this. And there were many other people and uh, universities. Uh, Associate Professor Brad Morridge, Mogridge, Torres Webb from CSIRO, et cetera, that jumped in to um, um, play a role in the penning of this um, particular uh, paper. And, you know, it just wasn't surprising to us that, number one, we did manage and did have governance around how we interacted um, with our cultural landscapes how we um, lived in harmony, how we were sustainable users of those natural resources um, across our cultural landscapes. And, you know, again, we were also guided by um, our laws and our customs and our dreaming. 
that are interwoven into our dreaming stories and our song lines. Um, I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, uh, water management and, and acknowledge the uh, Biami's Nunu, the Brewarana fish traps up in the top left hand corner. And, you know, how with water management and, and, and river management and the continued drive and, uh, towards connectivity of, of all our valleys and our systems, this is a, um, a, a, a co designed reverse rock ramp with the people of Brewarana and, and the nation, the Yimba people around that. So we do have literature, we do have also federal and state instruments that do afford us the opportunity to be more proactively engaged in, in water governance. Um, but I do believe that there needs to be a whole different ideology on how we go about engaging that more proactively and building the capacity and the confidence um, for Aboriginal people to be more involved in water governance. It's not easy when you're uh, a very much a minority group and operating in the arena with the uh, haves when we uh, as a people are still the have nots. Um, so next slide, please. So, you know, since the 67 referendum where we were, um, you know, finally recognised as a, a, a people of this country. We've had a number of um, significant events throughout that time, particularly in, in the uh, water arena. We had in 1983 in New South Wales, the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Rights Act. And, you know, enshrined in that, in that New South Wales legislation is uh, the opportunity um, to also be involved in water management through the governance structures that are administered under that, under that act. Then in 1993, we had the Federal Government's Native Title Act. And, you know, that brought about um, a, a whole range of governance structures to manage land. And, you know, the, the, the time now is for that, uh, those governance structures to be given the opportunity to um, be engaged uh, on the platform of truth telling and recognition of the connectivity to country, um, to be involved in the decision planning, co-designing planning and allocations and the long-term management of the resource. Uh, we had Mildren, the Murray Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations established in, in 2000 and the, the 2004, the Echuca Declaration that, I, that clearly articulated the need and, the, and, and you know, for cultural water, cultural flows to be recognized and how it should be recognised and the value added could be recognised across a quadruple bottom line, um, you know, the social, environmental, cultural and economic. Um, NBAN was established the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations. These were two key mechanisms that um, became a, a focus point in water management within the uh, Murray-Darling Basin jurisdiction. Uh, I also would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that you know, across the uh, across this country called Australia, there have been many, many, many um, key agencies and people in particular that have um, been involved in, in uh, the continuing and continue to raise the voices of the opportunities for Aboriginal people's um, voices to be heard. Um, we had the uh, National Water Commission and, you know, in 2012, we had the First People's National uh, First Peoples Water Engagement Committee, um, and they held the first uh, People's National Water Summit in Adelaide in 2012. The New South Wales um, Aboriginal Water Initiative, the first um, state to pick up um, the opportunity to, to have an Aboriginal Water Initiative. But look, there are many, many, many things um, that have happened in the plight of water in the water arena across this country. I also want to recognise the Mary River Statement. Um, and that that is also, you know, acknowledgement of, of, of the Echuca Declaration from Mildred and also NBAN as well, um, and the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. Interestingly enough, that the new closing of the gap, gap refresh policy, water is interwoven into it as a key target. And I paint the um, colour, the, the arrow green because it's a continuing journey or an expedition. Next slide, please. 
This is the background of the um, Aboriginal Water Initiative in New South Wales. Its primary um, 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 principles was that under the New South Wales Water Management Act, uh, to meet the further uh, and to further to meet the requirements of the Murray Darling Basin Plan. Sadly, the um, um, Aboriginal Water Initiative um, was um, abandoned, I suppose, or, or, or disbanded. But people still work in that arena. But they were out there very, very proactive. They were building the capacity using um, Aboriginal artwork and the Aboriginal way uh, of uh, communicating and engaging around what water management, what water assuring plans, what water management, natural resource management, particularly with water sites of significance, um, looks like, and where the opportunities um, for community to be involved particularly um, around the governance of it. Next slide, minute, please. Go, yep. Next slide, please. Engagement. I mean, there's probably nothing new in this. I think the key word there is leadership. You'll always get the leadership from the community. The you know, But leadership and our champions are, are emerging at a faster rate. But, you know, I think the time is here and now for us to um, be looking at a governance model um, that can engage and, and a national voice that can engage the rest of Australia, our Aboriginal Australia in the debate. Next slide, please. Water security, this is a, a community up on my country. Um, those solar panels were donated by Yusuf, formerly known as Cat Stevens and his Peace Train, Founda Peace Train Foundation. And it's got one tap and this entire community comes down and fills water bottles up to ensure quality water. I ask the question, why in this country, in this day and age, we've still got communities relying on international philanthropy and donations when it should be our responsibility and we have the governance, but not the goodwill to do something more proactive. Next slide, please. And I want to say Yene, which is a, a marabou, which is a thank you. I want to say Yene. Great, thank you very much, Phil, for that uh, very interesting uh, presentation and perspective. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Katrina Donaghy. She's co-founder and chief executive officer of Civic Ledger, an award-winning Australian blockchain company focused on building digital markets for tomorrow. Katrina began her career in the public sector and held senior project coordination and management roles with the Brisbane City Council, Queensland Urban Utilities, and the Queensland Government. She recognised the potential for governments and industry to apply blockchain technology to create new markets and economies of the future and co-founded Civic Ledger in late September 2016. In 2020, Katrina was included in the 101 Women in Blockchain. Over to you, Katrina. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the previous speakers as well. I always love the way they put all this all together because it's like building a scaffolding. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country which I'm meeting here today, which is the Cubby Cubby people here in Moreton Bay, um, and also to all the people, all the nations around this great planet, great country of ours. Um, I have a, a little bit of a different presentation today. I think what I'd like to present to you all today is, is a culmination of what happens when engagement occurs to solve a problem that is shared. It's a shared problem whereby nobody actually owns the only one solution to the problem where the solutions have to come from multiple sources. So I'd like to draw on some of the background that's been presented today and then sort of drill this down into a, a specific use case and sort of unpack how we have actually used engagement to bring about um, solving some really wicked problems within uh, Australian water markets. So one of the motivations that we've, we've sort of come to conclusion over the last five years working in this space of blockchain technology and governance and markets and natural capital is but there's no easy way to agree on our nature's value um, and then how to monetize that value. And as, as so we've seen over the years, particularly in Australia, it's very, very hard for market to, participants to make good 
of um, climate and nature commitments. And we sort of see that a lot of the barriers to these markets emerging is around the inertia around existing market and regulatory systems. So we sort of find that our current institutions and the way we have actually organized ourselves through our institutions are actually the key barrier to how we actually get beyond these wicked problems that we have, not only in Australia are actually going through, but globally as we're seeing now with water scarcity. Next slide, thanks. So just very, very quickly about Civic Ledger. Founded in 2016, and we started looking at digitising government issued assets such as permits, vouchers, rights, and things like that, and tokenising them, which is some of the language that you probably are hearing now around non fungible tokens and fungible tokens. We were using this technology a long time ago to digitise a water right because water right has very unique features um, and attributes. And just recently, of last week, um, Civic Ledger was accepted into the World Economic Technology Pioneers Program, the only Australian company to be accepted into this, into this uh, cohort. Um, and we'll be working with the World Economic Forum over the next two years to bring our water markets to a global audience. Um, we've been working with customers ever since we started. And as you can see, we've, um, we've collected a couple of accolades along the way. So next slide, thanks. So I always like to start because everyone's, everyone sort of goes, we sort of know what blockchain technology is, but we're not too sure, is it that crypto thing, what is it? So I want to really bring everyone onto the same page about what is blockchain technology. Now, I want to put the whole issue of cryptocurrencies to the side. Cryptocurrencies are important, particularly for uh, blockchains that use it as their native cryptocurrency to transact on the platform like Bitcoin or Ethereum. But what I want to do is talk more about what is the infrastructure. And blockchain technology is a very powerful technology. It is a digital layer that enables us to reorganize data. Um, and the way we actually securely share with it. And it's very, very different because it enables us to share information or data in a peer-to-peer -peer way where we actually remove intermediaries out of the transaction that are usually gatekeeping the information or making us pay more for that information. It's distributed, so it's decentralized. So it actually makes it a lot secure to attacks and data in which we see through centralized systems that gets where data is attacked or stolen. Um, transactions are immutable. So what that means is that once it's, the data is recorded to the chain, it cannot be changed. And this is really important when you're dealing with public resources where information around how those public resources are allocated or used is really critical to have that independent system. And it can never be erased. So we call this write once, append many. So data is written once to the blockchain and then it's appended to the next, to the next, to the next. So it can't be written over. What are the business benefits? It's, you probably hear a lot the word trust. And the reason why it facilitates trust is because we're able to actually inbuild into the blockchain governance systems around business rules on how things are to operate. And as I said, it removes the middleman, which often creates those gatekeeping and ensures traceability and auditability. When we think about water and water markets, one of the biggest challenges that we have, not only here in Australia, but also globally, is how do we account for water? Who knows how much is out there? Where are the records? Who's holding, the, who's holding this information? Is it private? Is it public? Who's got it? This is where blockchain technology comes in. It creates a, a ledger where we're able to account for water of who's got it, who's got it next, how much, and where is it being stored. The ideal use cases for this technology is marketplaces, which I'm going to talk about today. So let's talk about Water Ledger, which is a product that we, uh, we've been working on for the last few years. Next slide. So why Water Ledger? Um, we sort of see that emerging technology around digital technologies are a really game changer for the way water is, is accounted for, but also traded. It smooths out those marketplaces and transforming them into what we call auditable ecosystems, um, whereby every transaction is associated with that water right or that water allocation is compliant by design. That means it can't be frauded, it can't be manipulated, it can't be missing, and the data 
that is associated with that record is attached, so it can't be removed. So marketplaces for water, look, this is basically for an international audience because a lot of people into, outside of Australia don't understand markets. It's like carbon markets, but trading and water is, is a water market for trading water rights. Next slide. But I wanna just give you a quick, a quick background. It's critically important that we haven't just popped out of nowhere and gone, cool, let's have a look at water. We actually responded to the Australian government way back in 2016, where they actually put a call out to the market asking for innovation to start to have a different conversation around how to actually solve the problem of confidence in water markets. We were eight weeks, six weeks old when we responded to this bid and we were selected along with Mars and Jacobs, um, Athea and another company uh, to actually look at how we could actually solve or bring some confidence to those markets. Um, we were the only technology company to, that was selected to do so. And we were starting to explore the possibility that blockchain technology could be a, a real game changer. So we delivered the feasibility study in the middle of uh, June 2017. We weren't selected to progress with the uh, government. Um, Mars and Jacobs were selected. And as a result, some of you may be familiar with Waterflow. So Waterflow is an aggregation platform. It requires information from different pieces to come together to get a full picture of what's going on in the water markets. But we continued and we prototyped Water Ledger. We rolled out a pilot last year and now it's sitting in private beta ready to go into new markets. Next slide. So what I wanna focus on is a pilot. So all the, the conversations that you've just learned from the other three speakers, I wanna sort of show you how it works when you blend technology into a really wicked problem and how you engage a community who are the problem owners. And I think this is really um, some of the things that Pauline was talking about. Normally something is done to a problem owner, such as a water right owner, as we've seen through time, that government will do something to you to say, we will consult with you, take your information, go back, we'll go and figure it out, and then we'll come back and tell you that it's been solved and you've got to take it. We work in the other way around where we actually work with the person or the owner of the right and work outwards. So we actually conducted a, a pilot study in Mariba Dambula up in Far North Queensland um, with the Far North Queensland growers with the co-funding of the CRC for developing Northern Australia. We did have the operator and regulator in the room. Very interesting. I'll tell you a little bit about, about that at the end. Um, but most important, we had... Um, the people that we were solving the problem for. And that was our focus. Government, like the regulator and the operator, they were in the periphery. What we really wanted to know is, does this make sense? Does this solve a problem? Next slide. So meet Joe. This is Joe Morrow. And Joe Morrow is an irrigator up in uh, the Atherton Tablelands, and he's a mango farmer. And this is Joe. And I did not know this, but this is Joe doing our presentation. So you can see the CRC in the background. So he's got a room full of irrigators in the, in the room. And he basically just stood up and talked about water ledger. This is about, he talked about the problem, what we were solving, how we were solving and the benefits. Now, this is really interesting because this is an irrigator talking about blockchain and talking about how it solves those, those really challenging problems around transparency, information in the market, and how to solve those problems. So it was really, really interesting to see that. But let's have a go to the next slide and what Joe actually does, how he actually works right now. So he is a very a man in demand because what we found when we did our engagement, up at, so engagement with um, Mariba. A couple of minutes. Yes, sorry. Um, what we found was that the irrigators in those water markets weren't trusting the brokers, they weren't trusting the existing system. So they go to him and find out ask him, how much should I sell my water for? Who's got water? And as a result, the time it took to actually find water, make a decision and work out the price, it was up to between 60 to 90 days just to go through that process because information is not available out there. But also adding the complexities of legislation and all the different rules that are associated with that. And there's no independent system to show you what is actually truthfully happening in the market. Next. 
So we built this through the work that we did up in Marip and Dumbula. We took our prototype there and we worked with the irrigators. We just, we had to go back through, you know, verificating through human-centered design to say, is this the problem that needs to be solved? And, and how best to actually present the, the platform. And as a result of working with the person, the people that own the problem, we're able to elicit the feedback and verify our assumptions as correct. And as a result, we're able to actually build a platform for the trading of water rights or, or entitlements and allocations, whereby a government or a regulator or operator does not have to be in the transaction. Only needs to be in the transaction when the right when the, when the trade has to be approved, which gets sent to the operator. Next slide. And one of the most, and this is, um, I know I'm running out of time, but this is probably a very, uh, the game changer of water markets, not only in Australia, but actually in, 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 in globally. And this is because of working directly with the person who owns the problem. One of the things that we found was that uh, irrigators like to trade over the fence. They like to talk to their neighbours over the fence and say, hey, I've got some water, you need some water. So what we've taken is that concept of over the fence conversations and turned it into a digital wallet, whereby those actions are collected through the blockchain. So you, the irrigators can set up their own trading rooms. They don't have to operate with the existing markets that have been bestowed upon them by government. They have the opportunity to set up their own rooms and actually trade those assets with each other, but still be compliant by design. So every transaction will still appear on the ledger and every, every transaction is uh, codified to be compliant to the legislation. Next. So what we learned through this engagement is that it's best to design water markets from the bottom up, not from the top down. And the reason why is because water is hyper-local. Water is different in Northern Australia as opposed to the Murray-Darling Basin. It's completely different. And what we see is policy in this country around water markets is largely driven from the lens of the Murray-Darling Basin. But when you think about Northern Australia, it is completely different. So what you have to consider when you actually design solutions for markets is the hyper-localization of the needs in the market, the governance that are associated with those hyper-local considerations, and build from the bottom up. But ultimately, what you build from the bottom up becomes the overall picture of the market. And these systems need to be interoperable. So governance goes beyond just regulation and legislation. It covers off what does the data do? Who owns it? Where does it go? How do I share it? What is the privacy? What is the security? When is if I want to actually pull my data back? But also it's about knowing how to present that data and protecting it. Next slide. So one of the most interesting things that I've learned over the last few years is that you never wait for permission to change something. And one of the things that I've learned over the years and listening to the multiple media podcasts that I've been on and the different rooms I've been in and all the different webinars is that often we see and we go, why isn't government doing this? And why isn't government doing that? Well, we actually have the mechanisms and the tools now to build things from the bottom up whereby everything is compliant to government, but it actually puts the person or the people that have the problem in the front and in the center and we, and we design solutions for them. So it's about how do we use digital technologies that are actually emerging that all are about democratization and fairness and access and also transparency and trust. How do we bring those tools into play and inbuild the rules of the rules of the market, but also the design the governance systems to support those markets? So we're actually not wanting to create solutions in existing rooms. We're actually creating solutions for the markets of tomorrow. And that's why the World Economic Forum put us into their technology pioneers, because we're actually building solutions today that can be deployed today to solve yesterday's problems that actually build the future for tomorrow. So we see that blockchain technology brings the opportunity for the data interoperability across different, different data systems, but also the immutability. Next. So as we always end our conversations and our presentations is whiskies for drinking water, so fighting over. 
and we are seeing that this is more and more is going to happen. If we don't understand hyperlocality of water, design systems from the bottom up and inbuild the governance systems that are based on consensus and how we actually solve the tragedy of the commons, we're going to have these problems in the future. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share our journey with you today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katrina. Um, really, really valuable messages there for, but including for people who may not have had an appreciation before about how technology can be democratizing and can ease the um, understanding of people over the data that's out there, encourage fairness and trust um, in a world of fake news. Um, uh, questions around who gets the information transparency uh, of that information and who holds it and how it gets used. Uh, and technology enabling um, a, uh, a better and more transparent and a, and a faster and more usable way of managing that ecosystem, I think is uh, tremendously exciting. So thank you. Um, if, I, if people haven't already, um, if I could invite uh, panel members to turn their cameras back on and we'll go through the um, question and answer, go to the question and answer segment. Uh, now there's still time for uh, people with burning questions if you'd like to uh, enter them in the, um, the Q&A box uh, on, the, uh, on the Zoom conference, um, please do. So um, I've collected a few already. Um, so let's start um, maybe with, um, with Phil. Um, Harpeet has uh, asked a question uh, relating to uh, Australia as a very multicultural nation. What additional community engagement measures do you think need to be built into the stakeholder consultation process uh, that we commonly use? Uh, around water in Australia and do you think this is being done appropriately or are people just going through the motions? Bill. Um, thank you and uh, thank you RP for the question. Uh, Ab Aboriginal people we can we choose to live on our on our traditional country and for me it's about water security and water infrastructure for that for that future security. Uh, and water fit for purpose for everyday life. That is one of the fundamental things I see as a, as a, a huge issue. Um, whilst there are the ongoing conversations around um, water, water sharing plans, et cetera, and the management of water, I think there is a fundamental um, need um, to have better dialogue, meaningful dialogue. The research is there, the statistics are there. And in this day and age, I see, a, uh, I can't get my head around why we are, uh, as an Aboriginal community, are still relying on interna international philanthropy for water infrastructure, for water security, for everyday fit for purpose. So meaningful engagement and resource it properly. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, now, I'll just go to the next question. Uh, and it's, um, it's from Declan to Pauline. Um, and Declan's question relates to the IAP2 quality assurance standard for community and stakeholder engagement that you mentioned, Pauline. Um, and the question of how well it actually uh, promotes uh, community, true community engagement. Um, particularly down to the message of community empowerment that you talked about. Uh, do you think um, the water sector needs to shift away from IAP2 towards a new engagement standard? And who could set such a standard, Pauline? Thanks for the question, Declan. Can, can uh, um, rely on you to pose a, a challenging question. <clears throat> I... I don't know who could set the new engagement strategy. Okay, so that's my very frank answer. I think it needs to be set by an international body, whichever the body is. And I think it could, people within the I, 
a I um, IAPP members of the IAPP could start that conversation. And the conversation would be not to have that ladder or spectrum, which is based on academic work of that ladder of participation that we're all familiar with, which, but to say this spectrum concentrates on the various alternatives. There is no standard. The IAPP doesn't say you must do this. But we as a community, uh, uh, the academics, practitioners could say, yes, we have a spectrum. Let's try for collaboration. And that if, if enough people in the community and practitioners say this, it will come about. Now, it is already coming about in the academic literature. In the past 10, 20 years, we have been talking about collaboration, collaboration. So the academics are there. It is for the practitioners out there to agitate. Now, Declan, you may have mistaken my uh, explanation of the 1994 and 2004 uh, policy documents as setting a standard. And, and in a way it does. The, the policy documents in Australia talk about consultation, okay? And it is for the community then, all the NGOs, uh, stakeholders, the traditional owners who I do not consider a stakeholder, traditional owners and indigenous people are powerful property owners, okay? It is for all of us to build a collaboration that tells the government when you talk policy, do not use consult anymore. We want collaboration. So I hope that's an answer to your question. Thanks very much, Proline. Um, next question, probably I'll put to Josiah, I think. A um, uh, question from Antara. Could you suggest how to form local water advisory committees in small towns um, and how you go about engaging them with government? What type of information needs to be given to a community to form such a committee and make them influential? Josiah? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, in terms of that uh, question um, on how do we, um, I, will, I will speak from my experience working in, um, in the humanitarian, um, humanitarian, maybe we, you, can, you, you can all translate it to your to your water, the water work, works on water. Um, in terms of um, community forming the advisory committees for disaster risk uh, response, eh? here in the Pacific, um, at, the, at the village level, in Vanuatu, they have their community, what we call this uh, community disaster com committees. Um, there are already platforms because for us, we have, as I already explained, there are traditional um, governance systems that exist together with national governance system, not only at the national level, but also at the subnational and the village level. So what we do was that uh, we com um, there is um, a complementarity in terms of how these governance systems uh, work. Eh? So at the community level, with regards to disaster risk, they, they the villagers themselves, they form their various committee um, um, in terms of disaster. And I, and I must say that there is also a committee on uh, water on wash that exist in nearly uh, all villages in uh, Fiji. Eh? So the, these are communities that are from the level and they are recognized at the subnational level because we have provincial councils and also at the national level with, uh, with the relevant line ministries. So those are some of the things, um, but, but again, it needs to come down um, coming from the communities themselves um, and they continually engage. Uh, the, the, the thing with Fiji is that we have district representatives um, or village representatives, village headmen who represents the community to the various uh, levels of government eh, and so forth. And that's something that uh, within the water advisory committees, that is something that you can, uh, you can uh, also, um, also um, um, adopt if you want to have that water advisory committee. Thank you. Thanks, Josiah, very good advice. Uh, we have a question from Imran, who's based in Pakistan, and I might let Katrina have a go at this one. Um, 
So uh, Imran has asked, what's the importance of mobilizing sufficient financial resources, technical capacities, uh, and justice in community engagement processes for water governance in terms of the climate change challenge? Katrina, do you have a do you have a take on that? I certainly do. Um, it's really interesting because again, it gets down to data. We're seeing now the requirements of organizations, corporate organizations globally, to be now disclosing their requirements around all their obligations under ESG. So financial institutions are now looking to those sustainable institutions or those sustainable industries that are addressing water scarcity or security and putting it into their strategic um, uh, strategic um, plans. We've seen um, superannuation funds, for example, a guy in Brisbane took his superannuation fund to court because he believed he wasn't looking after his public good because he was the superannuation fund was investing in the wrong industries. I think what we're seeing is the financial institutions are, are key to unlocking the opportunity around infrastructure investment that links into how we share public resources in a fair way, but it will come down to disclosure of data. And also consumers taking up the arms and actually pushing for change themselves. We can't be sitting around as citizens anymore and say, well, I'll still participate or buy that garment because I like it, even though the sustainability chops aren't very, very good. We also have to take responsibility in those supply chains um, in terms of climate change, if that makes any sense. Thanks very much, Katrina. Um, another one to Pauline from, uh, from Reba. Um, Reba makes the point that um, the Murray-Darling Basin guides a pretty thick and complex document, and uh, there are many other examples around the world of integrated water resource management plans for transboundary water resources being uh, quite detailed. Um, so what happens if the community feels excluded from those conversations just because of the mass of information and data before them? Is there a need to communicate short and easy versions, um, particularly translated into local languages, um, about what these plans are meant to achieve and who they are meant to benefit? Sorry, you're on mute, Pauline. Common failing. Okay. There's a tension between uh, the mass of data that exists and the communication of that data and the understanding of the recipient of that data. So that tension, I think, can never completely be resolved. But there are ways to try and overcome it. The technical data has to underpin whatever decision to be made. It has to be there and it has to be transparent because um, without the data, we can't make a good decision. What has uh, been, been useful from experience is that data is translated into a summary. That data, it can be not only in a summary, but in an, a visual form. So we talk about info, info visuals often. So very complex relationships explained in a visual, which makes an impact on the viewer. And increasingly, ac academics do it all the time, right? When we use PowerPoints, we are using infant visual. So if we can do that and then allow the viewer to then go to the data and, and, and um, interrogate the data, that would be one step use of info visuals. The second step is all that data can may not even be interrogated by the, the, the usual layperson. If you give me a big treatise on climate science, 
I would not be able to interrogate it. Sorry, I'm a lawyer. However, if you can get a peer reviewer to interrogate that huge document and give a summary and say, yes, I verify this, okay, or a panel of reviewers, that makes it much more user friendly for the, for the uh, consumer or the community. So those are my two suggestions for uh, approaching the communication of uh, big data to, to ordinary people. Thank you, Pelding. Um, I have a question from Megan, uh, and it's about continuous community engagement, which uh, several of you have raised in your presentations, but I think I'll put to Phil. Um, so, Phil, in your view, uh, what are the key necessarily necessary elements for continuous community engagement? For example, you know, it's not a project or a policy development or a or a consultation event, but which has a start and a finish, but it's engage, ongoing engagement uh, to support both compliance and um, community confidence uh, that their views are being, are being heard. What do you think some of the pointers are there? And I guess this goes to the issue of, um, of, of community empowerment, the, 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 missing, the missing part of the picture that Pauline talked about in her presentation. Oh, thank you. And another good question. I think it's all about the relationship and the relationship that's got to be kept in place, um, how that relationship is uh, built on trust, on the platform of uh, integrity. Um, and that relationship comes by uh, a couple of things, taking, taking ourselves out of our comfort zones, sitting with people on country, sitting with people um, in their, um, in their place of comfort. Um, I also believe info visuals, if you're gonna use them, you gotta talk in simple English. You gotta create the trust by becoming a science communicator in, in, in a, uh, maybe a way of describing what I'm, that's what we gotta transform ourselves into. Um, and demystify that water speak and, and talk in simple English. And that too can assist in a two way relationship building and building the, uh, a lot more trust and confidence um, for that continuing opportunity to seek the opinions and the voices in community. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, so another another question which, which might build on this, um, uh, do you think um, do you think these sorts of perspectives and approaches uh, can encourage meaningful engagement with um, with other marginalised groups? So we're talking perhaps about uh, community members uh, with disability or uh, in in environments with um, poor gender equality performance. Uh, women and women and girls, Phil. Well, it's. I'm glad that you mentioned the female aspect because, um, in Aboriginal cultural law and in Aboriginal cultural way of life, a lot of the women are the um, are the not are water knowledge keepers, um, and are not engaged um, on that platform of respect and understanding that that's their role in a community government. So they look after that. Um, I see an opportunity now after coming through one of our worst droughts in this country's history where we can collaborate together because it is important that we do not take our sights off the vision uh, of the future and the next generations. And it's not an indigenous thing. It's a whole of community thing. And putting um, a framework around protecting this precious resource um, and I've said it, I've said it before, and people will probably get me sick of me saying, but we will be judged by the next generation on the on the type of environment that we leave them. So time for us to come together in partnership and look at a legacy platform that can help that, that, that can be strong enough for these next generations to step step on. It's not going to be easy. I'll say this: 
we as Australians have always been renowned for our ability to compromise and look after one another. And I think that, you know, I think the time is now for us to leave our preconceived positions at the door, come to the discussions or the conversation with a wondering mind on how we can be better together and protect this resource. Sorry, I know it's a bit of a political statement, but it's something that I'm very passionate about, partnerships for the next generations. No, good for you, Phil. It's, a, it's an important message to be repeating. Uh, I might go to Josiah now. There's a question here from Medad, who's based in Iran. It's an example of um, the Australian Water Partnerships Worldwide Network. Um, and Medad asks, uh, how is the water problem either similar or different when you compare issues from a traditional owner perspective, an Aboriginal or a traditional owner perspective with Western worldviews? Is there some particular difference between those worldviews when we come to talk about water? I, th I think um, from, the, from a traditional point of view, eh, in terms of uh, water, um, what, um, let me just check the question again. How are some, Sorry. Can you repeat the question again, uh, Mike? How ask a question about whether traditional views of water compared to conventional Western world views of water um, are, are different, whether the traditional world views give us tools and richness and understanding mm. uh, that we're not getting from um, from conventional approaches. Thank you. Um, from the, uh, for instance, for, for the worldviews in terms of what, um, what is a necessity eh, for, and for many of us in the Pacific as well, um, it is a necessity. Um, in terms of merging or um, they, there might be a need to merge the two worldviews uh, when it comes to water, whilst also recognize the various um, the various, um, how do you say it, um, the, the added value of the, the different, uh, different worldviews when we come to water. Eh? For instance, we, we talk about traditional conventional approach to water. Um, for us here, when it comes to water, uh, we need to recognize the, the, the resource owners. Eh? But when it comes to the conventional water, even in, the, in, even in uh, Fiji, it's, it's, it's something that is required, uh, uh, the tools that we have for government to, to, to provide that. Eh? But we have um, the mechanisms that in place, how do we merge the various worldviews in order for, for, for communities to, to have that access? I hope I've answered uh, that question um, uh, to our colleague from Iran. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Josiah. Um, maybe one last question because we're, we're coming to time. Um, it's another one from Declan uh, to Katrina this time. Um, so uh, like, Decla like, like Declan, I've learned a lot about um, uh, technology and innov innovative thinking, um, but how in a technology-driven set of techniques around community engagement, do we ensure that some marginalized voices uh, are left unheard and, and voices are not represented um, uh, within that uh, central technology-driven debate? And, and how do we make sure that marginalized and, and vulnerable groups um, don't get left behind in that conversation, especially if um, access to and uh, and use of technologies is is, um, is less available. Thanks for the question. Um, it gets back down to governance. Um, technology is only an enabler, but humans still need to participate. Humans still need to design 
the environments or the culture or the or the solution on what's going to be fit for purpose for a community or for a local area. It's not about saying tech first, problem second. We design solutions that are actually um, consensus driven through the community. And any solution that you build, and if you are, this is what we call about being responsible around technology. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And you could say that there are quite a lot of ex, uh, examples of technology that should never have been built because there is a lack of awareness of these very questions that, are, that Declan's been asking today. So when you start building technology, you, you start with a governance framework, an ethical reference point, a governance where you're asking, what is the design elements that we need to agree upon? What harm could actually come from this if we don't pick this up or doesn't do this way? So you don't build tech first, you build the frameworks and the governance and all of that sort of stuff. And if there are missing voices in that, then it's the role of the community to actually bring that together. It's not the role of the tech. I think there was a second question there that, um, that yeah, that's right. So in terms of getting the community to involve in data and things like that. So the thing too is that markets, even though you might have a market solution to a problem, this is where the markets of tomorrow take on board that ESG, cultural, all of those sort of things are not mutually exclusive to the way markets are designed. Yes, they did in the past because of the institutional economics and the social economics. Today, you design markets, you must take into consideration environment, social, governance, cultural, all of those design principles because they must reflect society. And that's where technology is an enabler. It's not a gold bullet, it's an enabler, but it's humans that actually are at the forefront of, why, of how this tech actually is resolved. Great, thank you very much, Katrina. So it's uh, almost come to time. I'm going to ask each of our panelists um, to give a very crisp final thought or final takeaway message for our audience on community engagement from the various points of view that you've presented today. Uh, maybe I might start with you, Katrina. I'm mute. One of the things that I've learned over the years is, as I said at the start, don't wait for permission to change things. Don't just because you may be sitting in a bureaucracy or within a big organization and kind of go, oh, but we always do it this way. Don't be that person that says it's okay if we keep doing it this way. Be that person that stands up and say, how can we do this differently? And don't do something to someone. Don't you actually have to ask the person who you're solving the problem for and engage, but don't wait for permission to do so. Great advice. Uh, Phil, what's your takeaway message to us? Um, I believe that this particular webinar should be um, testimony to that we can share our knowledge mm. and we should share our knowledge. Um, and with technology, we can transgress boundaries, borders. Um, I think the, other, the key thing for me is that we all need to be better together. Um, we all need to think about um, what a future looks like for our, for, well, what our future looks like in the water arena. I ask a question, how many people love fishing? How many people like fishing for natty fish? So, Look, my message is let's get together, let's be better together, let's be stronger together, let's do something together uh, that can make a change for our kids and our grandkids and the next generations. I'm glad we've got you, Phil. I'm very glad. Pauline. Um, my single most, um, my single point that hopefully people take away is that if you are in charge of a process and if you're in government, be aware that the community want more now. They want a, perhaps maybe not a completely bottom-up approach because that may not be possible, 
but it is possible to blend the approaches. Top down can be blended in many ways with the bottom up. And one of the ways to do this is in the problem uh, setting uh, stage. If you involve the community in setting the problem question, then you probably get an engaged community. Mm. And if you're in community group here, if the government, if the process allows engagement at the start, be there. Be there. The earlier you can, the more you can shape the process. Mm. Be there all the way through. Yeah. yeah. And and oh, yeah, and yeah. And help and help set the problem question. Yes. Right yes. at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Josiah, you were generous enough to frame our discussion today and start us off. So what's your parting message to us? Um, for me, I'd like to reiterate that free prior and informed consent for any community engagement um, mechanisms, you need to to inform them, um, especially for projects uh, such as water or for any other development projects. There is a need to involve them in the conceptualization as uh, already highlighted by Dr. Pauline. Um, right to the review, you also need to report back what are the outcomes of this engagement? How can we move forward? And that uh, continuous two-way communication is vital if we need to ensure the sustainability of any project. Thank you. Thank you, Josiah. Very, very valuable message. And the key word there is is informed, uh, and and it's it's something that that governments and uh, large organisations often overlook. What does it really mean for people to have informed consent, and to be comfortable that their consent has been informed? So, thank you very much for that for that powerful message. Um, Obviously, we chose our panelists today to give, give different perspectives on, on community engagement. Um, they're all working on these issues in different ways. Uh, so I'd like to thank very much once again, Josiah, Pauline, Phil and Katrina uh, for giving us some um, really good lessons and, uh, and ideas and perspectives today. Uh, thanks to everyone who has joined us today for the webinar, um, our uh, large and wide and international audience. We haven't got through all of the questions that people had um, put to us, uh, but if your burning questions remain, please uh, feel free to email us at contact at waterpartnership.org.au uh, and we will attempt to liaise with the panelists and get answers to your burning questions. We will provide a summary of today's webinar and the presentations themselves. And we do hope to see as many of you as possible at our annual partner workshop on the 5th of August in Canberra and online. Uh, please visit our website at waterpartnership.org.au to su subscribe to AWP updates, newsletters, and to follow us on social media. Once again, uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you very deeply from me uh, to all of our wonderful panelists and please have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.